We need your covering. We need your anointing. We need your blood in this house. I was reminded this week and this morning even, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Enemy, I refuse to let your strategy come against this. this morning I declare we come against any spirit of oppression that is attached to any family represented in this house for we are a church of unity I don't care if there's strife or striving Lord God we come we come against it in your name Lord Jesus when we enter into this house you are our focus God our eyes are set upon you not our troubles not our trials but our eyes are placed upon you God because you deserve the worship we don't come to worship our pain. We don't come to worship our disagreements. We don't come to quarrel, God. We come to place our eyes on you. So, Lord, redirect my eyes to you. Place my eyes back onto you, God. And help me to search my heart, God. Help this church to search its heart, Lord Jesus. Let this be a house of repentance, Lord. And let it begin with me and in my home and in my family, Lord God. Holy Spirit, have your way. We will not do this without you. We will not, we will not have this service unless you are in it. Because God, we want our words and our worship to, to be pleasing. We want our words and our worship to be pleasing, God. We come to please you this morning. That our eyes are focused on you. Yes, Lord, we fix our eyes on you. 
we fix our eyes on you and only you, God. We won't let our gaze wander to another. We fix our eyes on you because you are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our attention. You are worthy of our worship, God. We fix our eyes and we fix our ears to listen, God. We fix our ears to listen, God. We want to hear you. We want to hear your voice, God. We want to hear and we want to obey, Lord. We want, when you say go, we will go. When you say go, we will go, God. We want to hear your voice, God. We want to know you, Lord. We want to know you, Lord. We want to know your voice, God. We want to hear you, God. Jesus, we come to worship you. We come to exalt your name in this place. We exalt you and worship you by placing our eyes and our ears upon you. That we move when you move, Lord. We speak when you speak. God, we're here to be ministers unto you. We are priests unto you, Lord. Lord, we minister to you first. We minister to you first, Lord. God, we exalt you. We put you in the highest place. We put you in the highest place, Lord. Everything else in, in a high place must come down in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. No distractions, no worries, no wants, no needs, God, because when we're, when we're in your presence, there's nothing else needed. When we're in your presence, there's nothing else needed, Lord. So I declare that you're in the room. I declare that you're in the room. I declare that you're in the room, Lord. That we're in the presence of the King. We're in the presence of the Almighty One. So, Lord, we lift you up this morning. We lift you up this morning with our thoughts. We lift you up this morning with our prayers. Lord, we intercede to your kingdom. We intercede to the throne room, Lord. This morning, we, we come to worship you. We come to praise you, Lord. Jesus. Oh, I feel a heaviness and I just if join with me, please, as you lift up your voices, because I feel like we need to get a little louder. We need to get a little louder. So Jesus! Jesus! Jesus, 
We desire your presence, Jesus. Lord, lift the, lift the weight, lift the weight. Replace it with your covering, Lord. Break off any weighty presence. Break off any weighty presence, Lord. Let it be your weight, Lord. Let it be your glory. Let it be your, your magnificence. Let it be your presence, Lord. Bring a refreshing. Bring a refining, Lord. Pierce our hearts this morning, Lord. Let us hear you. Let us see you. Let us know you, Lord. Lord, we come to bring you a pure praise. We come to bring you a pure praise, Lord. We come to bring you a pure worship, Lord, for we are your bride. And we come to meet with the groom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're so faithful. You're so faithful. You're so merciful, full of grace, full of glory. King of glory, come into the room. Manifest your presence in this house this morning. Because you're holy. As you're holy. You're holy. You're worthy. Almighty. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for creating this house, for creating this atmosphere, Lord, for preparing this atmosphere, for entering in and making this atmosphere for what it is, God, where we can come and receive healing and peace and joy and refreshment, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you for the unity that you pour out upon us, Lord, as your bride. We come together this morning as the bride. We come together as the bride to come and celebrate the groom. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the healing. Thank you for the restore, restoration. Thank you for the redeeming blood. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're holy, Lord.
presence. Oh, beautiful Jesus, your presence. We come right in, we come right in. We look right at you, we sing right to you. Yes, 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 beautiful Jesus. Holy Spirit, show us Jesus. It's who we want to behold. It's who we want to behold. Oh! 
a message for us and I believe it's he is more costly than gold he is more precious than anything and he's asking us who don't have tons of gold and tons of silver if he is worthy for you to let down your opinion your pride your being right and lay it before him to walk in humble submission before him representing him to those around you in quietness and strength and humble submission to the king of kings and the lord of lords who is coming back and yes he's a lamb but my god is a lamb with power and strength and authority and he loves and his blood covers but he also judges so put it under the blood now and live live in his love live in his strength and give it all to him all to him because you are precious in his sight and he is counselor he is counselor he is mighty god he is mighty god and he's the prince of peace He's the Prince of Peace. The Omnipotent. The Omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. Oh, he's radiant. The Almighty God. He is Counselor. He is Counselor. He is Mighty God. He is Mighty God. He's the Prince of Peace. The omnipotent. He is wonderful. He is wonderful. He is radiant. He is radiant. He is radiant. The Almighty God. His name is Jesus. His name.
Jesus. His name is Jesus. His name is wonderful. The counselor, the Almighty. Come on, just sing it one more time. His name is Jesus. It's a beautiful name. See the crown of thorns and 
angels glorify the anthem that goes day and night. Worthy, with eyes like fire, hair like wool, voice like many waters roar, matchless and most beautiful. Just worthy, yes you are. The elders bow, the preachers cry. Worthy. 
Lord, we declare that you are holy. Lord, we're reminded this morning, Father, as we began worship and saying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. We're reminded of John the Baptist, God, and we're reminded that he was the one who You know, John the Baptist's ministry, it says that he preached this message. He went around and he was like, I guess, kind of this evangelistic type message because it seems like he only had one message. And his message was this, to his ministry to prepare the way of the Lord. His message said, repent, repent, repent. And we think repent just means. to turn around and there's this picture that preparing the way of the Lord involves repentance. It involves a changing of your mind. And so often we say, God, come and help me. But we never reorder our mind and we never ask God to come in and reorder our mind with his word. You know, his word brought order into chaos and creation. And in the same way, his spoken word, Jesus was the word of God in flesh who came and became and dwelt among us, it tells us in John chapter 1, John the Baptist beheld his glory. And in that same way, we take the word of God and we apply it to our mind. But sometimes, and we got this word on Wednesday at Content, that sometimes we have all this junk in the way. And we're saying, Jesus, come in, come in and help me. Come in and, and deliver me. Come in and save me from, from my the chaos in my mind and in my heart and in my family and in my life. But we have never prepared the way of the Lord with repentance and saying, fear, you have to go. And in insecurity, you have to go and bitterness you have to go and unforgiveness you have to go and addiction you have to go it doesn't mean i have to have it all together it means right now in this moment i push everything aside and i say the king is coming make room make room make room and i'm preparing a place that's holy the scripture says that the prophet he told the woman go and borrow vessels from all of your neighbors not few he said get as many as you can and go into your house and close the door and the oil began to pour from heaven into empty, clean vessels. And so right now, Holy Spirit, we empty ourselves. We repent. Come on. You know what you need to make room from right now. Push it aside. Push it aside. Holy Spirit, come. We change our mind. We repent. We turn from sin. We turn from bitterness. We turn from fear and insecurity. And we make room for the Word made flesh. We make room for the Word of God who speaks life into dead places, who speaks in order, comes into chaos. Right now, Holy Spirit, we make room. We make room. Go ahead and cast your fear down. Go ahead and cast your shame down. Go ahead because he's worthy. Make it a holy place. Lift up a holy worship and say, you're holy. You're holy. You're holy. You're holy. Oh, Jesus, come and fill the empty places in our hearts. Fill it in our minds. Let's worship for one more minute. Make room. Make room. Make room. Make room. Make room or you might have to push it out of the way by force. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And anyone who opens up, I will come in and I will commune with them. I will dine with them. We open up. Oh, Holy Spirit, we open up. Oh, Jesus, we open up. Oh, yeah, my Tradition, break down the walls of all my religion. Your 
to the prophetic word this morning that I received. And I want to pray for the sick. The scripture says that if there's any sick among you, gather together the elders of the church and anoint the sick with oil and they'll be healed in the name of Jesus. So I want to ask you, if you're up front and you're not sick, will you back up? If you're sick this morning, will you, if you have any sickness in your body, any pain, anything, we want to pray for you this morning. We're believing that the Lord still heals. Will you come up front here so we can see you? So we know who we're praying for. And I want to ask some of the intercessors to come together. I got some oil up here. I want to ask Aislinn, will you come pray with us for sick people? We recognize the gift of God on this young lady's life. She's prayed for multiple people and they've been healed. So come on, you just go ahead and pray from right where you're seated this morning. Father, we just declare that by your stripes we have been healed. You paid for it at Calvary, God. We just declare that every illness, every disease, every cancerous cell, every tissue and every organ in the body has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And so we plead your blood over every person standing here to get prayer this morning. We declare that they are healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, pray for them for just a few, four, few more minutes. Till we get through them.
Father, we remind our soul who you are this morning, that everything is under your feet, Father, that everything that we've been stressing about and worrying about and, 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 and causing chaos in our mind this week, Father, that it's under your feet. And so we declare to our soul right now, Father, we just tell it, be still and know that you are God. Father, we will still our heart and know that you're God. Your presence this morning is confirmation that you're with us, that you'll never leave us and you'll never forsake us, that you sent the comforter, God, to help us to deal with our grief, to help us to deal with our broken heart, Lord, to help us to deal with all of the issues of the heart. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. We receive it this morning. We ask that as we hear from your word, that same spirit would come, God, who inspired this word, Lord, and speak directly a rhema word, a word right now specifically for each one of us for what we're going through. I thank you that you're able to do it. I thank you that this is the eternal, uh, everlasting, uh, powerful, almighty word of God. And we believe today that it's going to do what you set it out to do. So right now, Father, we pray with every heart is open. Father, every distraction aside that we would hear from your word, that we'd leave changed in Jesus mighty name. Amen. Keep praying. If you're still praying, it's okay. We're going to if you're done, you can head back to your seat and we'll transition in a few minutes, but we'll let God finish what God wants to do.
Let's go ahead as we're praying and we're in this atmosphere of prayer. Donna Judd, uh, one of our sisters that goes here, she's going in for surgery in 30 minutes to deal with an infection in a tendon. So Father, right now, we just declare that you, you are God that your Holy Spirit is, is right there present with her in the middle of that hospital room. And Father, we just declare healing and wholeness, God. We declare that the doctors, Father, that you'll give them wisdom and, and that you'll, con you'll guide their hands as they do this surgery, Father, that there'll be no lasting effects, that the infection will be gone in Jesus' name. Father, we pray against any fear that's, that wants to overtake her, God, as she sits there preparing for this surgery. Father, we thank you, God, that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, God, and that you promise that she's in your hand. And so right now, God, we pray that your presence would be evident to her right where she sits, that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that you would guard her heart and her mind right now in this place. We pray it in Jesus' name. Father, we also pray for Joey and Keisha. Joey lost his sister this week, and he's back east uh, at her funeral as we speak. He's already back there. So, Father, we just pray over this family. We pray over Joe, Pastor Joey and Pastor Keisha. Lord, we pray that you would comfort their heart, Lord. We, we, Father, we just pray that all of their needs will be met, God, as they're gone, Lord, that they wouldn't worry about uh, missing work or whatever it is, Father, but that you'd bring comfort to this family through your Holy Spirit, that you bring healing to their, to their family and to their bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, worship team. Hey, uh... As Pastor Joey's gone, he called me this week and he asked me if we had anybody that could help and fill his pulpit this Sunday as he was gone, someone that we trust. And so uh, Pastor Mark Connor went over there and he told me, you make sure and tell the church where I am. I don't want him to think that I'm backsliding or anything. And so we told, I told him I promised him I would do that. He's over there uh, preaching for Pastor Joey and Chandler this morning. So pray for him uh, right now as the Lord, we just pray that the Lord would move in that service mightily. Hey, uh, we have a few things coming up this week, exciting things I want to tell you about. First of all, we're, we're Bobby D is back from Texas. And so he is going, wanting to do, uh, for the next two weeks, Monday and Tuesday night, we're going to get back to our sacred assembly. Uh, we were seeing God do some awesome things from 6 to 9 p.m. on Monday and Tuesday night, starting tomorrow. He's going to be here for this coming week and the following week, 6 to 9 p.m., Monday and Tuesday. Mark your calendar. Try and find some time. This is a time where you can slip in and slip out at your, at your convenience, maybe after work, after dinner. You can come by for an hour and just pray. And Bobby D., he's a, he's a DJ uh, turn G. Jesus freak who mixes de uh, as the Holy Spirit leads and plays the music that the Holy Spirit says, and it just ministers to people. There's just a special anointing on these times when Bobby D is um, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead him in this music stuff. So come by if you can this week. Also, Wednesday night, we have Contend as usual at 6.30, so don't forget about that. What am I forgetting? Oh, one more thing, and then I don't have Sherry. Are you coming up, or are you making Rick do it? Okay, Sherry's on her way. Uh, we are doing a diaper drive for the next three Sundays. We're ending it on Mother's Day because we have a few moms uh, and families that are having babies. And so we want to bless them for Mother's Day uh, with some diapers as they prepare. How many of you know diapers are expensive? Okay. Uh, we have a fully potty trained child. Thank you, Jesus. And so I remember diapers. It seemed like yesterday. It was. No. Um, but So we want to be a blessing to them as they prepare, and they have all these other needs. So if you want to donate uh, diapers, we're going to have a table set up for the next three Sundays. Oh, like I said, Mother's Day will be the, the last Sunday we take them. It's going to be in the foyer. You could also, uh, if you want to give like a gift card to Walmart so they can get other needs, you can do that too. We'll have a basket out there. So please plan if you can uh, afford to bring something for these moms. Sherry, come on up. And Rick, look at this. we got the duo tag team. We've always done ministry together, it seems like. You get one, you get the whole family. Um, so we got the Classics Luncheon this Saturday, or Classic Wannabes. We have a few that are almost 50, and they want to be there. So come on out. It's at Knuckle Sandwiches on Brown and Higley, right? Um, it's going to be at 11 a.m. If you need a ride, let me know. We have a couple people that need rides, um, Mesa and McQueen, and then Brown and Mesa. So if you're going to be there and you're coming, let me know. We can coordinate this. 
Um, if you want to be there and you don't have the money, please talk to us. We don't want that to be something that limits fellowship and just, you know, getting to know one another. It's, yes, it's fun, but it's also to learn about each other, to carry each other's burdens before the Lord and pray for each other and to build our community. Okay, we hope you can be there. Thanks. Thank you, Lopez. Uh, all right, I'm, ex- I'm excited to preach this morning. However, I got to tell you, this is, this is, I feel like this is a word that God has given me for our church, and it's kind of challenging. It's not the word that I wanted to preach. I tried to talk uh, to God about giving me something different, but I just could not get off of this. And so um, I hope that uh, the Lord uses it this morning. I want to preach to you from the title, God is doing a new thing. God is doing a new thing, and we're going to read the, the verses that mention this from Isaiah chapter 43 as we jump off here. We're going to start in verse 16. That'll be on the screen as well if you'd like to follow along, or you can turn there if you're quick. It says there in Isaiah 43, starting in verse 16, thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings forth chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So as we've talked about many times before, we've talked about how Scripture is uh, cyclical and not linear. So scripture is cyclical and not linear. And when you're studying it, this is important that God often tells the same story in different ways and he does it in a new way every single time he does the same thing. It's like these mirrors of these stories. And God throughout all of eternity, it's not just in scripture, God operates in cyclical ways. That's why it's so important we study scripture because we see how God operates and we can see him operating in our own life if we see ourselves in the story of scripture. We can learn how not to be like the Israelites going Going around the same mountain for 40 years because I studied the scripture and realized, wait a second, I've been going around the same mountain for four years or something. And, and so I can, I can break these things and I can uh, see my life come into uh, walking in God's ways and growing in him more and more if I realize this truth about scripture. So when God says in the scripture, forget what I've done, I'm doing a new thing. It's important that we understand this, right? It's important that we study it because if he said it, Then he's saying it now. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's operating in cyclical things. See, God is outside of time, and he spoke his word into time. And so that means from outside of time, from the beginning to the end, his word stands forever. And so we can take it and we can apply it to the current circumstances in our life. Okay, so that's what I want to do this morning. What I've realized uh, being a pastor for a little while now is success is often a hindrance to what God wants to do. Success, if we're not careful, it can bring complacency in your life. You see, I know people worship hot on the mountaintop. I know people worship hot in the valley. But oftentimes, when they're somewhere in the middle We can fall into complacency. My question for you uh, this morning is, what happens to your worship when you're walking in a season of success? What happens when you're no longer having to worry about your finances like you did in a previous season? When you were worried about them, you were crying out to God. You were going after. You were worshiping. You were surrendering. You were spending time. God, I need your peace. I need your peace. And now your finances are kind of leveled out, and you don't have to worry like you used to. What's your worship like in that season? What's your worship like when at one time you were crying out for God to save your marriage and, and he actually did, it's gotten better, and now you're in a season of kind of uh, marriage is just kind of successful and going well. What's your worship like in that season? What's your heart like in that season? What, see, everybody is being nice in some seasons and in other seasons they weren't and you were crying out to God for your relationships and you were crying out to God for all these things. What do you do when everyone's just kind of being nice and there's not really any turmoil in your relationships? How do you worship in that season? Because it, it makes a difference. You're not high, you're not low right now, you're just kind of in the middle. You know, I was reading about what happens in hurricanes because I thought, what happens to fish when a hurricane happens, right? And, and I found out that often the fish can sense that there's a storm coming and they dive deep. And you know what birds do? They fly high above the storm. But you know who's affected by the storm? Those right in the middle. 
the fish that stay in the shallow, the birds that can't fly higher than the storm. And the same is true in our life. Oftentimes, we worship hot in the valley. We worship hot on the mountaintop. But in the middle, we're affected by every storm that comes our way. We're thrown by every storm that comes our way. I've seen some people get delivered miraculously by God from a terrible situation. I've seen God heal their body. I've seen God move mightily in their marriage and in their life. And they're, they're so on fire for God. And they're so excited. And they're passionate about their relationship with God. They're telling their testimony to everybody. And then six months later, they're complacent. Six months later, they're in the shallow place again. And what I need you to understand, and this is not a message to condemn anyone. This is a message to challenge you. I'm calling you up. I want to see us grow as a church and individually and corporately. But what I've, what I've realized is that oftentimes people are using God as a means to an end. We think, okay, I'm okay right now. I don't really need God. And so I, I'll wait till I'm going through something again. You see what Christians do is many Christians live a cyclical life that looks like this. I go through a storm. I worship. I get breakthrough. I worship. Then I go through a season of peace where everything's going okay. I get complacent. And then another storm comes along and I worship again. And then I get uh, a breakthrough again and I worship again. And then I get into a peaceful season and I get complacent. It's the same cyclical cycle we see the Israelites go through all through the Old Testament. They worship God. They, they, they serve God. And then all of a sudden they forget about God. They get put into slavery. Uh, they cry out to God from slavery. God delivers them from save, slavery. They worship God for a while. They forget about God. They get put into slavery. Uh, God, they cry out to God as slave. Do you see the cyclical cycle? And many people's lives in their Christianity and their relationship with God is in the same sort of cycle. The never growing, just using God as a means to an end when I need some help. In fact, I'm actually the one who really calls the shots. I just call on God for help when I'm out of control. And this is hard for some of us to, to think about ourselves, but I believe God wants to do a new thing. And there's some people that are stuck in a cycle of doing the same thing over and over and over. I believe there's some of us that, that are, we need, what we need to do is we need to have a new way of thinking. We need to see God in a new way. And this is what we talked about this morning. It's like this repentance, this change my, changing of my mind. Here's what the scripture says that caught my attention this week regarding this, this new thing that God wants to do. It says it in Matthew 9, verse 17. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. What this is saying is that we need a new wineskin. I need a new way of thinking to maintain the new thing that God wants to do in my life. And so if I keep my old way of thinking, if I keep the old wineskin and I try and put God's new thing in it, it will burst and the new thing God wants to do is lost. So we need a new way of thinking. And, and I've learned about people that we don't, want, we don't really want new. We want new but same. You know, for Christmas when you're a kid, you hated getting underwear and you hated getting socks. You want the toys. You want the Nintendo. You, you guys don't know what Nintendo is. Uh, you want the whatever it is nowadays. You want the, you want the new Jordans. You want something, you, but you don't want the socks in the underwear. But when you become a man, <laughs> you put away childish things. Can I get an amen, man? You want new socks and new underwear for Christmas because you've been waiting. You needed them since like August, but, but you held off because Christmas was coming. And the truth is though, you want new underwear, but you want the same underwear you had before, just new. Like you don't want... Like, I'm a, bo I'm a boxer guy, and then you brought boxer briefs? Like, what is this, right? We don't like change, and, and, uh, but, but what I found is if I try the new, new thing, I actually end up liking it sometimes more than I like the old, new thing. Uh, maybe it's not underwear and socks. Maybe it's like everybody wants the new phone, the new iPhone 15. Everyone wants it. No one wants a Samsung, okay? That's what um, <laughs> nobody wants that. Every, but, but, what, but what I've learned is nobody actually wants to switch phones. So if you have an iPhone, you want to stay with the iPhone. If you have a Samsung, you want to stay with the Samsung. Because nobody wants to learn that new 
programming system, right? I don't want to learn iOS. I'm used to the Android system. I'm used to these things. And so we resist that. But how many of you know every time somebody gets a new iPhone, Come on, this is prophetic for somebody who's been thinking about switching to iPhone. About two weeks later, after the frustration of learning a new operating system, many times people say, where has this been all my life? But we resist the new. We want new but old. I want the, old, the new thing, but I want it the same as I had it before. And we do the same thing with God. God, I want the new thing. We're crying out for the new thing you want to do, but I want church the way I'm used to it. God, I want the new thing that you want to do, but, but I, want the, I want worship to be the songs that I'm used to. Don't have them do too many new songs. Because how am I supposed to worship if it's different? I want the preaching to be the style I'm used to. I want the service to end when I'm used to it ending. I, I want to spend a couple hours on Sunday going after God, and that's enough. I want new. I want God to do a new thing, but I want it the same as the old thing. I want it to look like I'm used to. I don't really want the new, new. But here's the truth that we're going after at Encounter. We were designed for more. And if you try and put the new thing God wants to do in the old wineskin, you'll lose it. But that's what we do in church. We want to keep things the same. And we think sooner or later, the new wine is going to come into the old wineskin. But I think oftentimes, we're not waiting on God. God is waiting on us to come into a new wineskin. To change the way we think. To, to change the way we look at God and what he wants to do. But sometimes it takes breaking an old way of thinking, an old way of what I'm used to. It takes breaking off the old thing to get the new thing. It's not just in church. We do it in marriage too. Remember when we used to write those cute notes to each other? Remember, babe, when you used to make my lunch when I went to work and I'd open it, there'd be like a cute little note in there from you? Or remember, remember when you would send me sweet good morning texts when we were dating? Oh, that was the best. We didn't text. We're too old for that, but I'm trying to be relevant. Uh, <laughs> remember when we'd get little butterflies and I'd get them in my stomach when I saw you? Remember that? Remember when, when we used to close the bathroom door? Remember that? <laughs> Wasn't that sweet? But the truth is, is that no matter how much you try and apply it, it, the old thing, you can't relive the old thing. You can try and redo the old things, but it's different. I mean, it's not butterflies anymore. Now it's like indigestion, but it's different. You can't redo the old thing. It's a new thing. You don't have the same riz when you're 47 as you did when you're 22. Come on, young people. That was for you. Older people, riz means charisma. Okay, there you go. We're learning. Pastor Brent, back in my day, I was the best basketball player. Man, I'm telling you, I was so good at basketball. Bro, you look like you ate a basketball, okay? Like, let... Let the past go. See, we want to relive the same old thing over and over. God's people are famous for doing this. God, send manna from heaven again. God, send the Azusa Street Revival again. God, do what you did back then. Do it again. And can I tell you, I think God is saying, I want to do a new thing. Because I don't, I don't go from one thing back to the same thing. He goes from glory to glory. And so God is saying, uh, we have to open up our mind because it says that he's prepared for us things that we can't even imagine. So God says, I need you to change the way you're thinking because you can only think according to what you've seen. That's why your entire life is based on what you've been through oftentimes because we haven't repented and allowed God to change our mind that so our actions and our words are not based on our trauma. They're based on who, what God says and who God says I am. Does that make sense? So it takes repentance. It takes changing my mind or I'll end up trying to put the old person into a new system and the wine will spill out. Many people encounter Jesus, but they never change the wineskin over their life. And over time, the new thing that God wants to do, it spills out. They go in, back into complacency. They were on fire. Youth, you were on fire after Winterfest. You were on fire after youth camp. And over time, because we never changed the wineskin, and we hung out with the same friends, and we spoke the same way that we used to before, and we got back into the same habits we used to before, we fall into complacency, and the new thing God put in us, it spills out. I know because when I was a teenager, I went through the same thing. Many failed relationships are not because the person wasn't the right one. 
it was because we never got a new wineskin. I never prepared the wineskin. So when the new thing, the new wine came in, I lost it. That's why I always tell single people, you don't wait for Mr. Right. Don't wait for Mrs. Right. Become Mr. Right or Mrs. Right right now. Because you think Mr. Right is going to come along and he's going to want you, but you've never spent time preparing the wineskin that's to make yourself Mrs. Right. And so when the new wine comes in, I'm not prepared for it and I ruin it. While you're waiting for a wife, become a husband. Women, while you're waiting for Boaz, become a Ruth. That's, that's good preaching. That's good advice right there. See, God had a, God had a great job for you, because, but you lost it because you never, found, you never prepared a wineskin of being a good employee before you got it. You never disciplined yourself before you got it. God had, God had uh, new things for you, but you never prepared the wineskin. You see, what I'm telling you this morning is that there's a maturity that needs to come to your life to be able to handle the new thing that God wants to do in us. You individually and us corporately. God wants to do a new thing, but it takes a maturing to come to his people for us to be able to carry the thing. There's a new wineskin of maturity for a new thing. You remember in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says God, it's, if, you, if you don't believe me, you can go look at it. It says God created and it says he planted a garden in Eden. It, I've never really noticed this before, but it, it, why does it say he planted it? Did you ever think about this? I mean, God made Adam and Eve fully grown, but he planted a garden. And why didn't God just make things fully grown? And I thought to myself, probably for the same reason you don't want your kids to be born fully grown. First of all, ouch. Okay, second of all, I mean, I don't know from experience, but it looks painful. Ouch. Uh, The second reason is because we love the process of raising children. Maybe that's why you can give yourself a little grace in your relationship with God this morning because you haven't arrived yet. But maybe it's okay to to give yourself a little grace this morning and say, wait a second, God loves the process with me. God is not ashamed of me in the same way when your kid doesn't listen or makes bad choices, you don't cast them out from your family. You discipline them because you love them, but you love the process and you're wanting them to grow up to look like a well-formed adult. It's part of the process. Here's what I've learned about raising kids. They resist every new thing. They don't want the new thing. They like the way it used to be. They don't want to try new foods. They don't want to learn to use the potty. They don't want to give up their bottle or their pacifier. They don't want to learn to clean up their own messes. They don't want to learn to do their own laundry. But only through walking them through every step and stage of their life do they become fully grown and functional adults that can handle society. Amen? But it takes the process of saying, it's time for a new thing. I know you're used to me cleaning up your messes, but you do that now. And that's not something that they're going to appreciate. And I think many Christians are like that in your relationship with God. God says, it's time for you to mature and do things different than you did before. And we, we throw a little hissy fit and we don't really like it. And we find ourselves going through the same cycles in our life because we refuse to do the new thing that God's asking us to do. It says in the scripture, after God planted a garden, he put man there. And then it says it's not good for a man to be alone. But, but we've talked about this in the past. It's actually a better uh, translation from Hebrew there to say, it, it, God said it's not good for man to be all one. Because we know he took Eve out of Adam. That they were one, that they didn't, they didn't need one another, that, they were, that he was alone. But out of Adam came Eve. And we know that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God, both like God in different ways. Men and women are individual and different, but both made in the image of God. Amen. And so he made Adam and Eve in such a way that they needed one another to reproduce in the earth. They needed one another. They they couldn't do it on their own. Adam needed Eve, and Eve needed Adam to be obedient to the Word of God because God told them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. So for them to be fruitful and multiply, they needed one another. And we see in in Genesis chapter 3, Eve operates out of unity with Adam, listens to the lies of a serpent, eats eats the, the food, eats the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She's trying to produce something on her own based on a lie the enemy told her that you can get more out of life if you do this. 
You can reproduce something better. You can make something better on your own. God's perfect union is broken. God uproots them out of the garden. He takes them to a place that's uh, less fruitful. The, the Bible then says God curses the ground. It's a picture of loss of fruitfulness because they did not stay rooted in the place God put them and operate in unity with one another, that they needed one another in this place. So it's a picture of the person who meets Jesus and tries to walk this out alone. Do you know that you're called to be planted and rooted in a place with people that love you, that, that it, it's, they're actually called to do this together? Do you know what a lion does when it's hunting? Do you know how, what it does? It doesn't attack a herd. It looks for a prey that's isolated and alone. Because it knows that it can be overcome by the herd. But if it can find a weak, a young, a wounded one, a slower uh, member of the flock by itself, it can take and attack that one member. And the enemy operates in the same way. That we are actually called, that we need each other, that we're better together. And this is important because I believe fruitfulness and dominion were sacrificed by our first mother and father in the Garden of Eden. A picture of who the people that were supposed to be the maturity. Now they lost fruitfulness because, because they, they uh, sacrificed being fruitful where God planted them. They tried to do it on their own. And this is why I think this is important. It's I think this is restored through fathers and mothers in the church. This speaks of maturity being planted and rooted now. You know what we're lacking in the church, in the world today? Fathers. You have many preachers, but you have few fathers. And I think it takes a people realizing, wait, a minute. I am going to be rooted myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to find some people to, to plant myself in a place under fathers and mothers and become a father and mother because all maturity comes through rooting your lives with family, with rooting your lives with fathers and mothers and coming under some people who have maturity and we grow up, but we're so far from this now. I was reading this week about redwood trees and redwood trees, they, they don't dig their roots deep. Redwood trees, they dig their roots far out. And I've seen some, have you ever been to Northern California, Oregon, and seen the redwoods? There, you can drive your car through some of those trees. And so what we need to realize is that the strength of the redwood forest comes from them being not rooted deep, but rooted with one another. You see one father and mother tree, an older tree, younger trees come up around it and they spread their roots into the roots of the father and mother tree and they gain stability from the more mature trees. And in the same way, God created the bride of Christ in, in that way that we would become a church that's a forest of redwoods that could provide shade and fruit for a city. But it takes people saying, I'm going to come out of immaturity, out of the cyclical nature that my life has been before, and I'm going to root myself with some people, with some of God's people. I'm going to get into family, and I'm going to see my city changed and my life changed. The biggest problem, I forget who said this, Pastor Josh, you remember, the biggest problem in the church today, is a, it's a quote, uh, is the orphan spirit. You remember who said that? Someone said that. So I'm going to look it up later, I promise. Someone said that. Maybe I said it. Yeah, I said it just now. Uh, but here's the thing is the orphan spirit, what that means is it's is basically a people who reject invitation into family because you're afraid of rejection. So because I've been hurt before, I'm afraid that no one will love me. And so I reject family and I keep people at an arm's length because I'm afraid of not being loved. This, this is a problem in the church. And first, the revelation has to come to your heart that you are fully loved by God. This is the only thing that will deal with an orphan spirit, with a person who feels rejected and unloved. You will not come into family until you realize that God loves you fully and completely right now. And out of that revelation, you can then come into family and join family because I'm not looking for a place to find out I'm loved. If I find myself trying to make you feel loved enough where you get healed, we've already come into a territory that is unhealthy spiritually where I'm trying to do a job that God says he's going to do. 
If you're asking people to come around you and make you feel loved, I'm, I'm going to ask you this morning, come back to the first place. Say, God, I need a revelation that I'm fully loved. That then out of that place, I can get into healthy relationship and I can join a family without fear of being rejected because I'm already fully accepted by God. So I have three things this morning I want to move through before we close how to embrace the new thing. The first one is move from seeing an example to being the example. Okay, every ch child that grows up moves from a place where they're under a father and mother to where they actually, most of the time, hope to find a spouse and become a father or mother themselves. And many in church never see the future in that way. They come and they stay under a father and mother for the rest of their life, never saying, I don't want to look at a father or mother as an example. I want to be a father or mother. I want to come into a maturity where other people see me as the example, not me always looking to them. Some of you are, here are really good, and in every church are really good at pointing people to myself or my wife or Pastor Josh and Jen or other leadership. You should go and have Pastor Brent pray for you. And I get it. Some of us were newer, new Christians, and there's grace for that. But I'm saying at some point, we have to come to a place where we say, I don't want to point out an example. I want to be the example. I want to pray for you. Because the same God you pray to is the same God that I pray to. And he doesn't hear me better or love my prayers more. It's actually a revelation that only comes through maturity, right? And so we, we have to get to the place where we don't have this Moses in the wilderness mentality where, where the Israelites constantly come to Moses and say, speak to God for us, Moses. Moses, go up the mountain and tell us if God's mad. Go up the mountain and tell us what God's saying to us. Pray for me, Moses. I love to pray for you. I'm not saying I'll never stop praying for you. But we have to come to a place where we don't say, I see an example. We say, I want to be the example. The new that God wants to come and do in this church is going to be released from people who stop looking for an example and they become an example. Have you ever been swimming and there's these people there who aren't there for swimming? They're there for the furniture. And they say things like, don't get me wet. I don't want to get wet. I don't want to get my hair wet. And you, and you, can I tell you something? Many Christians live their life like that, but this is a house where we want to make a splash. Like we want to get into the deep end. We want to go deeper. We want to see all that God has for us. And we're not going to settle. We're going all the way in. We're not sitting on the sidelines spec, spec, spectating. That's the word I'm looking for. And we're inviting you to come with us. And oftentimes we treat church like that person sitting on the side of the pool watching examples. That's what swimming looks like. I'm always surrounded by all of these great swimmers, but I don't want to get wet. Can I tell you, this is, this is actually your invitation to grow into maturity and say, God wants to use you. God wants to, you to grow. He wants you to come into a deeper place with him so you can stop excusing yourself from maturing. Um, well, I'm not really a leader. And, and you can stop excusing yourself from some sin that you had in your past that you feel like it's not that important to deal with because you're not a, a leader. And, and can I tell you, you're supposed to be an example, not point to examples. At some point, you got to stop making excuses for uh, the words that come out of your mouth and say, I'm just, I'm just growing and God has grace. He does. But at some point, you got to say, God, help me with my mouth. God, help me with my addiction. God, help me with my, my situation where I keep falling into the same sin over and over. Well, I'm not really a leader, and you know, I'm just, you've been a Christian for 30 years. Deal with it. Ask God to deal with what's going on in your life. And so we, don't, we no longer have to say, hey, my pastor's actually got it together. I just point at him. No, you need to be an example to the world. This is what maturity looks like. From, hey, have you seen their marriage to no Look at my marriage. We are the example. We're the example of what a godly marriage looks like. Look at how his wife treats him. Look at how uh, he treats his wife. No, look at how we treat one another because we're the example. And if I'm having an issue with the way I'm treating my spouse, God, help me to be more like you. Help me to love my wife like you love the church. 
and I want to grow. I don't want to have to point. I want to be the example. From looking at marriage as somewhere you wanted to be t- to the place of embracing singleness and saying, I'm going to be an example of what it looks like to be go- a godly single person in the world, not thirsty for every person that wants anything to do with me, but pointing to God and saying, you're all I need. I'm complete in Christ until the day he provides a spouse for me. This is what maturity looks like from, from looking at people who pray as the example to saying, no, I want to be the example of how to pray. Uh, I'm just not there. I just don't pray like that. God's saying, what are you waiting for? Start praying and you'll be an example of what prayer looks like. Start growing, start embracing it and saying, I'm not going to keep making excuses for my continued cycle in my life over and over. Well, if that never happened to me when I was a child, I'm breaking that in Jesus' name. I'm taking on the identity of Christ, not the identity of my past. I was born again into a new family with a new identity, and I now look like Christ. I don't look like my past anymore. And if that's not your story, it can be. So this morning we say, in the name of Jesus, we break every trauma and word curse from your past that wants to determine determine who you are, and it's making you an excuse for you to stay in the shallow end. And God is saying, I'm inviting you into the deep. Father, we deal with every lie of the enemy that's been uh, holding a ceiling over people's heads this morning in Jesus' name. We plead the blood of Jesus over them. Where are the young people at who want to be an example in this generation? The truth is, is that you can keep making excuses. Well, I'm too young. Do you know what Paul said? He said, let no one despise you in your youth, but be an example. And so we, we make excuses. And I did the same one, thing when I was young. But I want to ask you this morning, what are you waiting for? Be an example now. Show them I don't have to talk like you and act like you. And I can still be around you. I can still be fun. I can still love you. But I'm not going to be pulled into everything you're pulled in because I'm different. Because I'm an example of what a young person who loves Jesus looks like. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says it this way. It says, For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places or realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. God wants to point at you and say, look what I can do. Look what I can do with someone who's been through hard things. Look what I can do with someone who didn't grow up in church. Look what I can do with someone that everybody else wrote off. Look what I can do with someone who was stuck in addiction for years. Look what I can do with someone who'd been divorced before, but now they're embracing what a godly marriage looks like this time. Look what I can do. And this is, this is crucial that we come to this place where people, where we look at ourselves and we say, I don't want to look like I used to, where people, I can be an example where people say, look at that student, look at that dad, look at that mom, look at that husband, look at that wife, look at that business owner, look at that employee, look at that friend. God wants to use you as an example. And here's the lie of the enemy. You're disqualified. None of us are disqualified. You are not disqualified. This thinking is the old wineskin that needs to be thrown out this morning. A new wineskin needs to come in. And the new wineskin is this. You were chosen in him before the foundations of the world. What? Before the foundations of the world, before you made any mistakes, God knew the mistakes you were going to make. And he said, I choose you to be an example. That's, you say, the Bible says, here's what the new wineskin looks like. You are co-heirs with Christ. Well, I don't deserve that. I'm disqualified. No, you're not. You are an heir of everything that belongs to him through his blood, through the grace of God. When God looks at you, he doesn't see your mistakes, your weaknesses, and your sin. He sees Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And so by coming out of the old wineskin, taking on this new wineskin, I say, wait a second. I can walk this out and be an example with his help. He's going to help me. The thing is, I grew up in church, and I grew up singing songs like, Our God is an awesome God here. You remember that? With the weird verses. Our Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out. I know. Josh, let's do that next Sunday. I want to hear you sing that part. Um, (laughs) Get back to your rapping days. I grew up singing, Lord, I lift your name on high. Remember that? Uh, But anyways, I digress. I never knew... God wanted to use me. 
until I had, con- I had made a mess of things in my life. And when I was 24 years old, I, I said, God, whatever you want, however you want it, I'm yours. And, and in, that to- in that moment, what happened is I got rooted in my faith and I began to grow. And we see stories of this all through scripture. As I'm reading this week, I see all these stories that I could just relate to in my life. Like we we see stories, uh, Jesus goes to this man, the Bible calls him a demoniac in the caves. Do you remember this story? And in the story, Jesus goes and he finds this man and he's been chained and in caves. He he lives outside of civilization, outside of the city. He He has no roots He's outside because he's been cast out. Jesus uh, comes to him, um, and, and we see in this life that he's cut off from society. It's funny that he's homeless and he has no clothing because these are two things that a father is supposed to provide, a home and, and clothing. And, and we think to him, ourselves, how did he get here? How did he get here? And it's easy to judge him. His, light, his inner life is in shambles. But if we're honest this morning, it's easy to judge, but we won't let a father or a mother look through our phone. Because if we're honest, our inner life is in shambles. We've just learned how to put on a different face. And it's time to come to a place where we say, God, I want to grow up into what you call me to do. And here's a lie of the enemy. If you show someone, if you root yourself with people and actually expose what you're actually dealing with, they're going to reject you. Do you know that a good father actually doesn't cut people off when they show what they're going through? Actually, a good father, he raises them up and lifts them up. You know the verse I was actually looking at this week? Because as I was studying this, I thought of this verse. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. John 15, 2. So I looked up this word that uh, in the Greek that means cuts off. And it's arei, if I'm pronouncing it right, A-I-R-E-I. And it means to raise to lift up, to take away, or to remove. So we see a picture that, that there's a translation here that says he'll cut it off, but, but it can also be translated, and the Passion Translation does translate it this way. It says, every, every branch is bearing no fruit, he lifts it up off the ground. And in the same way, I think we have feared allowing people into our lives, being rooted with people because there's oak tree or there's redwoods around us, but we're afraid if I, if I get under the surface with them and I start to grab onto them, I'm going to get hurt and they're going to reject me. But the truth of God's word is if you actually root yourself with redwoods that you will find stability and they will lift you up off the ground. The second thing is if you're, if you're looking for how to do the new, or allow the new thing that God wants to happen in your life to happen. It's transition from consuming to giving. And these last two are very fast. I'm finishing up. Um, Eve, she's in the garden. She has been created in a way where she is called to give and take from Adam there to do things and be fruitful and multiply with one another. She lost her authority in her, in the earth to bear fruit in a certain way. The ground is now cursed because they rejected their root system. Their hearts became focused on what she could get individually. I can bear fruit alone. And it's a picture of this consumer culture that we built in church that I can do this alone, that I can bear fruit alone. We, we come to receive. We come to receive the word. I want to receive the presence of God. I want to receive a touch from God. All things we should receive, but we take no responsibility to give of ourselves to build others up. This is, this is what leaders do. This is what, no, remember, we're going from looking at examples to being an example that all of us will be rooted with one another as a forest that can bring shade and fruit to a city. But we want it our way. We shop churches according to preference. I want a church that is uh, this length of time, that does these types of songs, that, that uh, they're my preference for worship. And we, what we've done is, is we've said, I want it my way. I want it in my old wineskin. And the new wineskin is this. God, you can have it your way. I want obedience over convenience. Have it your way, God. I have, here's the new wineskin. I have something to offer. I can't sing, but I can worship. I'll bring my worship and add it to the worship of everyone else in that house. I, I, I can pray for people. I might not be able to preach and I might not be able to do certain things because of health, but I can, but I can pray for people. I can work in e-kids. You have something to bring. I can, I can give something in the offering. 
I don't, I don't give because, uh, Pastor Brian, I don't really trust because I don't know what the church is going to do with your money. Can I ask you, do you know what Starbucks does with your money? <laughs> you don't want to know what Starbucks does with your money. Uh, anyways, I'm not talking about giving this morning. It's, no, it's about your old way can't contain what God wants to do through you. And the truth is, if you're just here spectating, oftentimes our relationship with God is always inward and never outward. And we live our life like a sponge, and we come to church, and we fill up the sponge, and we leave, and we never pour it out, and we say things like, I'm just not being fed anymore. Can I tell you, a healthy diet, if if you're a sponge, is in and out, in the same way with your eating every day. In, not to get too graphic, out, okay? (laughs) Actually, you're not called to be a sponge. The Bible says you're called to be rivers. A river of living waters will flow out of you. A sponge takes in, but a river says, I'm just getting a flow. Everything I'm getting from God, I'm giving. And this is the proper way to live our life for God. Many of us are stuck up, if you know what I'm saying. And I'm here to be your spiritual ex lax in Jesus' name. No, I'm just kidding. We gather. Anyways, moving along. Holy Spirit, come back. We gather here to build one another up, that what God does here, we should take out there and affect what we do out there. I hear people all the time say, Pastor Brent, I've encountered God. And my question for young people, if you've encountered God, why do you still disrespect your parents? Or men, if you've encountered God, why are you still disrespectful to your wife? If you've encountered God, why do you still look like the world? Why are you still selfish? Why are you still negative? And why are you still making excuses for why you don't give God what he's asking of you? It's time for some of you to take the mentorship and the wisdom that you've received and give it out in obedience to God. That God does not built you up and made you a sponge and filled you with every good gift from heaven and given you uh, spiritual gifts and given you the gift of his word and you've been soaking it up for years and saying, I, I, that's all there is to it. Can I tell you something? You'll be blessed when you begin to give it. When you begin to pour it out. When we say, I'm not a, tr- a standalone tree. I want to root myself with other people, with younger trees, with other people who might be older than me, but they haven't known the same revelation I've known from God. And I'm going to grab onto their roots and we're going to stabilize each other. And we're going to grow up together to change families and cities. Josh, can worship team come up? The Bible says it this way, and it's a very popular verse. You've heard it. It's more blessed, blessed to give than to receive. Many people never see the new God has for them because they never transition from being a consumer to a giver. You have something to give. The last thing, transition from I wish to I will. There's power in your confession. There's dominion in your confession. That there's authority in your confession. It's a trans, it's a transfer, a transition from I wish I could have a marriage like that to I will have a marriage like that, and I will be a husband or a wife like that. I wish we could reach this city to we will reach this city. From I wish I could see breakthrough to I will see breakthrough. I wish I could be a parent to I will be a good parent. I, I wish I could. I wish God would use me to I will be used by God because I'm being obedient and I'm submitted to Him. I will take terror. Territory. I will be the head and not the tail. Not, not I wish I could beat this addiction. I will beat this addiction because whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I will have dominion. God's not done. He's doing a new thing. My question for you this day is, do you perceive it? Do you understand God is calling you up from the cycles you've lived in and saying it's time to grow up? Individually and corporately. None of us have arrived The most mature person in the room, which by the way is not me, uh, still has room to grow. God's saying, I want to do a new thing. Oh God, remember we did the new thing last year. No, I want to do a new, new thing. And then next year, I want to do a new, new, new thing. You get the point. I'm not going to go on. We break old cycles of complacency and we root ourselves in God. I'm closing with this short story I, I heard this week. There was this, this man, he, he, was just, he just married his wife. They were newlyweds, and they were driving in a car, and they got into, tragically, they got into a, a head-on accident. The car flipped, and, and he, he was conscious. He, he looked over at his wife, and he saw his wife unconscious and bleeding in the seat next to him. 
he got out of the car and didn't know what to do. And he looked in across the street, he saw a sign that said, Dr. Johnson. So he took his wife out of the car and he carried her to the, to the front door of this place across the street. And he knocked on the door and a man answered. And he said, are you Dr. Johnson? And he said, I am. And he said, help my wife. And the doctor looked at him and said, oh, I, I haven't practiced medicine in years. The man, he stood there holding his wife, dying in his arms and said, can you do me a favor? He said, either save my wife or take down the sign. And can I tell you, I think that's God's word for this church and for his church in this culture and in this day. Either become like me or take down the sign. Become like me or close encounter. Because we don't need more churches that are reproducing consumers and people that, that are not growing because it's, it's an example unto the world. I don't know about you. I want to be an example that looks like Jesus. Will you bow your head and close your eyes with me? Father, I thank you, God, that you didn't create us and leave us in a way where you didn't provide the power and the authority to change and to grow. Father, we perceive the new thing you want to do in us corporately, and we perceive it individually. Father, I pray for that person who's felt stuck because of things that have happened to them, because of the way they were raised, because they've tried it before and they keep going back in the same cycles of sin and addiction or, or the same cycles of anger and the same cycles of, of divorce in every generation. But right now, Father, we thank you that you have the authority to break every cycle, God. We change the wineskin right now. We invite you to come in and give us the mind of Christ. We tear down every every voice, everything that wants to exalt itself up against the knowledge of God. We pull it down. We pull down strong hearts, strongholds. And we ask you right now, Father, to bring, give us a new wineskin in our minds. Right now, I just want you to individually, as the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about this sermon and how it applies to you, I want you to just begin in your own heart to just bring repentance to the Lord. Say, Lord, change my mind. I'm not less than. I believed it, but right now I repent. And I say, change my mind. I'm not stuck. I'm not, I'm not rejected. I'm not unloved. I'm, I'm not the, the, the one that you've forgotten about. I break every lie of the enemy. We break the power and the authority of sin over our lives. And we say, Lord, help us to, to have a life that resembles you in our deeds, in our thoughts, in our words. Father, what comes out of our mouth when we leave this place and we go back to school or we go back to work or we go back to our family's homes or we have conversations on the phone with them. Father, I pray that, they, that we would be the salt of the earth that you'd season our words with your spirit, God. Oh, Father, that we wouldn't be controlled by our emotions, but by the spirit of God. We lay them down. We surrender them to you, God. We want to grow. We want to grow. We want to look like you in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand up to your feet with me this morning? Maybe as I'm speaking, there's some things that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with you in your heart. It doesn't have anything to do with what I what I said, but he's been speaking individually to you. And, the, and this is a chance for you to respond to the Holy Spirit. We're going to worship for a while. And, and then uh, when God's done, we'll leave. But if you have to slip out during this time, you can, you can do so. Just take all conversations to the foyer. But I want to give you an opportunity before we leave, because the Holy Spirit's asked some things of you and saying, will you give me that? Will you root yourself with people and will you trust them? And maybe that's you this morning. You need to come up here and I'm going to have our intercessors, some of our intercessors come again. Intercessors, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you to lay something down, you don't come. You come and pray. You don't come to pray for others. And I want to ask you just to root yourself. And there might be something the Holy Spirit said, just share it with someone. And they're not going to reject you. We're going to lift you up in prayer. And we're going to walk with you. We gain authority. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another that you might be healed. Maybe that's what's been lacking. Maybe that's why you've been going around the same cycles, because you refuse to, to interweave your life with the roots of others. Father, today we break every strategy of the enemy, and we come into family, we come into being rooted with one another, and we lay down every lie of the enemy. If that's you this morning, and you need to come, and you need to just bring something to the Holy Spirit that he's been speaking to you, or you need to come and you need to root yourself with someone this morning, I want to invite you to come up now as we worship.